Would you open your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 6? And actually, we'll look at the last couple of verses of Hebrews chapter 5. And let me begin to read verse 11. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11, leading up to Hebrews 6, 2. Hebrews 5, 11 reads as follows. Concerning him we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Without saying a whole lot, what we're looking at in verse uh, 11 of chapter 5 of Hebrews is what happens when a believer instead, when he's in public assembly, he's listening to Bible classes, and instead of accepting, and that is believing what he's being taught, he does one of two things. He completely rejects it, and that puts scar tissue on his soul, and it immediately makes it harder for him to understand the next point. Or he does something else. He puts what he just heard on the back burner. And when it's on the back burner, he's saying, well, I don't quite understand this right now, but maybe after I get a little bit more information, I'll understand it better. And that's okay. But when you make that a habit, it's kind of like never brushing your teeth. Pretty soon you get all that grunge that grows up in there. And you become dull of hearing. And so what a believer, I mean, that's the reason that believers are called believers, because they believe the word of God as it is being taught to them day by day. Verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. That is, the the elementary principles of the word of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. In the ancient world, as it is today, when a person is ill, when a person no longer has the vim and vigor of good health, his diet is reduced to something which is easy to digest. Milk is the term that is used here. And... uh, I don't know about you, but you know I like pudding, I like jello, I like um, I don't care for soup so much. But every once in a while, uh, Elena made this one soup this one time. It was good. What can I say? But you know there are some foods that are meant for adults and not for babies, and they've been pureed. What that means is that something in your health has gone bad. And so now you need to have this soft, squishy stuff so that you can uh, continue to live and because uh, you're, you're that bad off. And so that's the uh, meaning at the end of verse 12. Verse 13, For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. The word of righteousness that is used here is doctrine which is beyond the basics. This is doctrine which now is going into the adolescent aspect of, of uh, spiritual growth and mature stages of growth. And so he is an infant, an infant. Verse 14. But solid food is for the mature who because of practice, that means a repetition, That's dint. In other words, you do it over and over and over and over and over again. Now, in order for a person to really grow naturally the way God intended uh, to grow spiritually, you need to take in the Word of God over and over and over and over again. And there's a corollary between physical health and spiritual health. So, if you decide that you are only going to eat one day out of seven, 
you're going to lose strength. You're going to lose muscle mass. You're going to lose acuity of thought. You're going to lose energy. And you say, yeah, but at least I'm eating once a week. The same thing occurs, it correlates into spiritual, into the spiritual life. So you need to take in the Word of God on a daily basis because you eat on a daily basis. And one of the indications or one of the indices of a healthy church is when a church is able to produce daily Bible teaching. You may not come every day, but every day the Word of God is available for those that want to be there. And so for the eight years that I've been here, we have struggled with one day, two days, and every once in a while we sneak in another day, and it's kind of like, boy, that was a hardship. And so this is uh, an area that we need to ask the Lord for more oomph so that we can get off dead center and uh, put out the Word of God. It would be great that if you walk down the streets of Everett, maybe you're out in front of the Comcast Arena and somebody says, hey, where, where can I hear the Word of God? There would be no hesitation. There would be no uh, equivocance. Get it at Evergrace Fellowship Church. Well, what about this other place? Evergrace Fellowship Church. That's where you get the Word of God. Oh, is it open today? Oh, I'm sorry, you're going to have to wait. Well, you know, that kind of takes the steam out of the roller. Verse 1 of chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about Christ, let's move on to the mature things so that we're not laying again the foundation. And then we have a, a list of those basic doctrines. You have uh, the foundation of repentance uh, from dead works, faith toward God, the instruction about washings, and last week we finished with baptism. What's next? The laying on of hands. And so that is the doctrine that we are going to be looking at at this point. The doctrine of the laying on of hands. And in the background you can see that somebody is getting their hands laid on, on him. We don't know the reason why. Um, we can only speculate. So let me give you an introduction to ordination. Ordination is the laying on of hands. The word ordination gets its coloring from the word order, which is a command. So if, uh, if the officer in the military gives an order, he is given a command. It could be uh, tension, or it could be left face, or it could be right face. Doesn't matter. He is issued an order. Now, the order could be verbal, or it could be written in its five paragraphs, or it could even be implied. And we have a lot of implied orders. We could all be sitting here, and if somebody says, Fire! What's the order? Get out! <laughs> That's what the order is. You see? And so, the word ordination means that somewhere along the line, somebody gave an order and somebody's getting an order. That's what the word ordination means. Number two, there are several places in the scripture where this concept is preserved and where it does not refer to a man entering the ministry. And so let me give you, I don't know, about eight, nine of these examples. Numbers 24, 23 says that no one can live unless God has ordained it. <clears throat> what does that mean? It means that if uh, you were supposed to die on August the 30th, you can't hold your breath and make it to the 31st. Because if God has ordained for your death date to be yesterday, you're not alive today. You see. No one lives, no one can live unless God has ordained it. So you wake up one day and you discover, oh my goodness, these people aren't my parents. 
You were brought into this world because God ordained it. You're in the circumstances that you find yourself because God ordained it. You see. That's the sovereignty of God. He gave the order and poof, there you are. Secondly, Numbers 28 and verse 6. And here it speaks about the burnt offering having been ordained as part of God's guidance uh, on the way to Mount Sinai. And I don't want to get into the offerings too much, but a burnt offering is uh, an offering that accompanied all the other offerings. And it was ordained by God. In fact, the burnt offering is the offering that has been practiced even before the Mosaic Law. The burnt offering is not a sacrifice for sin as, as such. It always accompanies the sacrifice for sin. But God has ordained the burnt offering. 2 Samuel 17 and verse 14 tells us how the Lord ordained to thwart Ahithophel's counsel. And when we talk about political science and is God really in control... Well, we had a situation where it was very dark and King David was about ready to lose his life, his kingdom, and he barely escaped the city of Jerusalem with just the clothes on his back. Well, it's a little bit more now. He was the king. But he just barely got out of the city of Jerusalem and there were even people that were cursing at him. But he received word that God had ordained to thwart the counsel of his rival, who was his son. Psalm 8 in verse 3 says that God has ordained the moon and the stars. And that, you know, is one of those thoughts that blows your mind. I think the scientists have said that there's some meteor that's coming to the earth, or coming close to the earth, and it's going to hit us. Unless somebody can do something. I know they've made movies about it. But you know, God ordained the moon, the earth, the sun, all the stellar bodies. And he set them at different velocities and at different angles. And for some reason or other, we have been here on earth, even despite all of the controversy that we've encountered, thousands and thousands, maybe even millions of years, because of the order of God. Next passage. Psalm 111 and verse 9 states that God has ordained His covenant with His people. And that is one of those things that we find not only refreshing, but reassuring to our faith. That if the moon is still up there, and the sun is still there, and we are still having these 24-hour days because of the order of God, then it only stands to reason that if He makes a promise to me, that He's going to keep His word. That's reassurance. <clears throat> Psalm 119 and verse 4 says that God has ordained precepts for us to obey. We call it the Word of God. Psalm 139 and verse 16 makes it very clear that the days of humans have been ordained from the womb. So that God has made the provision. Proverbs 20 and verse 24 teaches that man's steps are ordained or ordered by the Lord. Isaiah 45, 12 says that God ordained all the stars, the hosts of heaven. Acts 7, 53, Galatians 3, 19 say that angels ordained the laws that the Jews disregarded. Now it isn't that angels actually authored the laws. God himself, we know that these laws were issued by God, not angels, but that God had these laws presented in the midst of heavenly hosts. When we look at the Sinai event, and how there was darkness and lightning, and it was the ministry that uh, was presented by angels. So there are all of these passages of Scripture, and you could probably find a lot more, uh, that refer to Somebody issuing an order and somebody getting an order. Does, may 
maybe you've heard of this story about how God gave a certain order and even the animals obeyed it? Well, <clears throat> we've looked at um, capital uh, uh, Roman numerals 1 and 2. Now number 3. There are several passes, uh, passages in the scripture where it does refer to a man entering the ministry. So we've looked at passages that, uh, that refer to a man not entering the ministry. Now let's take a look at some where man is entering the ministry. First one is found in Exodus chapter 28 and verse 41. Would you open your Bibles please to that passage? And let me begin to read at verse 40. This is Exodus chapter 28, verse 41, but I'll read at verse 40 while you find the place. For Aaron's sons you shall make tunics, you shall also make sashes for them, and you shall make caps for them, for the glory and beauty. So here we have this instruction that God has given. Actually the instruction is like a command. And it has to do with the vestiture uh, that's going to pertain to Aaron and his sons. In other words, the Levitical priesthood. Verse 41. You shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him, and you shall anoint them and ordain them. Notice this word. And ordain them, consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. Well, we have three verbs that are involved here in verse 41. It says, you will anoint them. That's the pouring of oil on them. There is the ordain them. That means the ordering them. And then it says here, consecrate them. Well, consecrate means that you reserve them. That is going to be their job. The ordain them means that that's the order that, they, that they're getting. These are their marching orders. The anointing with oil is symbolic that God has given them the divine ability to be able to execute their job in life. So you could be a priest, you could receive your anointing, that is the uh, ability that God has given you to perform your task, you uh, could also be set apart, in other words you won't be working at the garage today because you're a priest. You won't be working at the grocery store because you're a priest. But you could just decide that you're just not going to do what God wants you to do. He ordered you, but you don't have to. So, in uh, Exodus 28 and verse 41, we see that there is this particular order for men to go into the ministry. Next chapter, Exodus 29, if you'll, if you'll uh, look down the page a little bit. Exodus 29, and uh, as uh, you are uh, looking down the page, let me begin to read then at page se or at, at verse 7, that gives us the same uh, parallelism. Then you shall take the anointing oil, pour it on his head, and anoint him. You shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. You shall gird them with sashes, Aaron uh, the, uh, and his sons, and bind caps on them. And they shall have the priesthood by a perpetual statute. You shall ordain Aaron and his sons. And so here we see that the order is given to the sons of Aaron as a perpetual statute. In other words, this is the law that will never end. This is their order, their marching orders. If you would, uh, jump down to verse 29. The 
holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him, and uh, that in them they may be anointed and ordained. And so here we see that when the ordination takes place, that uh, you really need to be wearing, you know, your the garments that are appropriate for that. Verse 35, Thus you shall do to Aaron and to his sons according to all that I have commanded you. You shall ordain them through seven days. And so here you, you have the word command used and you have the ordaining service to last seven days. So, Second passage of scripture in the Old Testament talks to us about how ordination was not just a light thing. It wasn't a simple thing. It was a, it was a substantially significant thing for the people of Israel. Now would you turn to Numbers chapter 3. chapter 3. And I'll begin to read verse 3. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the anointed priest, whom he ordained to serve as priests. Now I want you to notice the structure of this verse. It covers all the bases. These are the ones, these are the ones that have an assignment, they have been sanctified, and they are going to serve as priests because they've been ordained for that. <clears throat> now, let's take a look at another passage of Scripture, and this, shall we call it, phony ordinations. I'm sure you're familiar with them. You've seen them advertised on the internet, you know. Get ordained online. Get your degree online. Or something like that. Become a minister. Be licensed. Would you turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 13. Now, we want to look at verse 33, but we need to look at this in its context. So let me begin at verse 1 of Numbers chapter 13. Now behold, there came a man of God from Judah to Bethel. Now Bethel is the capital of the northern nation. There's been a division in the, in the kingdom. There's now a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And so we're told that the man of God, who was from the southern kingdom, was sent to the capital of the northern kingdom, Bethel. It was a capital uh, because that's where the king had his joint, and that's where the king set up his, uh, his chapel, his church house. And he also set up a golden calf there for the people to worship. And so uh, we are told here, by the word of uh, the Lord, verse 13, while Jero Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense. Now, in uh, verse 1, we see that the king is standing by the altar to burn incense. This is a strict violation. Royalty does not mix with priesthood. And so you immediately know that something is wrong. He cried against the altar by the word of of the Lord, and he said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Jos Josiah, by name, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be split apart, and the ashes of which are on it shall be poured out. Now, this should already say something to you. The altar be split apart? 
How could that be? Well, it just so happens that this was a humongous altar. It was actually made out of dirt, and it was up like about three stories high. And so this is uh, not your regular altar like you would see in the temple in Jerusalem, because the northern kingdom always wanted to do things better. They were not going to be held back by Jehovah, the living God. They were going to be a secular, commercial nation. Now when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar in Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him! But his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up, so that he could not draw it back to himself. Okay, what do we know about this prophet, this man of God? He was somebody who was ordered by God for a particular job. He went to do the job. The king of the nation was violating Levitical code. And when he heard this prophet prophesying against the altar and against him and everything that his nation stood for, he wanted to castigate him. He sent out the order for something to happen to him. And when he stretched out his hand to point him out, he got sick. Because God protects his anointed. And this is a warning. Do not ever get caught in the trap of criticizing the communicator of Bible doctrine. Because you will suffer, and you will suffer, and you will suffer. And it's very important that you can sin against a lot of other people, but you don't want to go there. So, he stretched out his hand, and he could not draw it back to himself. Verse 5, the altar, uh, the altar also was split apart, and the ashes were poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. The king said to the man of God, Please entreat the Lord your God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him, and he became as it were, as it was before. Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me, refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall eat no bread, nor drink water, nor return by the way in which you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way which he came to Bethel. So here is this man. What does his ordination consist of? Go and deliver this message. But don't have anything to eat there. Don't have anything to drink there. Don't have any entertainment there. Do the job. Turn around. Go home a different way. Simple orders. Verse 11. Now an old prophet was living in Bethel. Okay. An old prophet. Now let me just tell you something about Bethel. Bethel had been converted into being very liberal, very secular. But the king, this Jeroboam, knew that if he tried to restrain the people, they would leave his kingdom and just go down to Jerusalem and become part of the southern kingdom. And he didn't want to lose them. And so what he did is that he set up a seminary and he installed professors there, old prophets. And he paid them, he put them on the dole, but he said, you know, you must do all that you can to differentiate between the belief in Jehovah, the living God, and the gods that we establish. You know, we're more tolerant people. We can accept other beliefs. We're the National Association of Idol Worshippers. And we'll accept anyone. So, see what you can do. So, that's how this person is introduced. An old prophet was living in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the deeds which the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken to the king, these also they related to their father. Their father said to them, which way did he go? Now this, uh, now his sons 
had seen the way in which the man of God who came from Judah had gone. And he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey uh, for him and he rode away on it. So he came, uh, or he went after the man of God and he found him sitting under an oak and he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. And then he said, come home with me and eat bread. Do you see what's going on here? See, this is one of those like trick questions. Come home and eat bread with me. Verse 16, he said, I cannot return with you nor go with you, nor will I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. For a command came to me by the word of the Lord, you shall eat no bread nor drink water there, do not return by the by going the way which you came. He said to him, I also am a prophet like you. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat and drink. But he lied to him. So he went back with him, and he ate bread in his house, and he drank water. Now it came about as they were sitting down at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah saying, Thus says the Lord, Because you have disobeyed the command of the Lord and have not observed the commandment, that is your ordination, which the Lord your God commanded you, but you have returned and eaten bread and drank water in the place of which he said to you, eat no bread and drink no water, your body shall not uh, come to the grave of your fathers. And it came about that after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, that he saddled the donkey for him, for the prophet whom he had brought back. Now when he had gone a lion met him on the way and killed him. And his body was thrown on the road. You see, ordination means that you as a man recognize that God has given you orders. That you are under orders and that your head is Jesus Christ. Now we won't go into other passages, but the Bible tells us in the New Testament that if you have respect for your commanding officer, your hair is short. Now you take a look at these ministers with long hair, I can tell you for a fact, they are false. And you have no business listening to them, or even giving them any type of comfort. Because they're telling you, just like this guy told this other guy, come back to my house, because an angel of the Lord spoke to me, and he told me to give you bread and water. I want you to know something else. Do you notice that these guys have names? You know they don't have names. And they don't have names because they're not supposed to have names. I might see you later. They don't have names because they're not, so, they're not supposed to be known. They're generic. They're supposed to be interchangeable. It could be you and it could be you. And so then the Lord has to be true to his word. And so he sends a lion. So let me go back to where, uh, where we were. Um, verse, uh, let me begin at verse uh, 24. Now when he had gone, a lion met him on the way and killed him. And his body was thrown on the road with the donkey standing beside it and the lion also standing besides the body. And behold, men passed by and saw the body thrown on the road, and the lion standing beside the body. So they came and told it in the city where the old prophet lived. Now when the prophet who brought him back from the way heard it, he said, It is the man of God who disobeyed the command of the Lord. So did the old prophet know what he was doing? Of course he did. He was as dark with sin as dark could be. Verse uh, 25. 
verse 26, who disobeyed the commandment of the Lord, therefore the Lord has given him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. Then he spoke to his son, saying, Saddle the donkey for me. And they saddled it. And they went and they found his body thrown on the road, and the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. The lion had not eaten the body, nor torn the donkey. So the prophet took up the body of the man, and laid it in on the donkey, and brought it back. And he came to the city of the old prophet to mourn and to bury him. He, la he laid his body in his own grave, and mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And after they buried him, he spoke to his son, saying, When I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones, for the thing shall surely come to pass which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria. You know what you have here? You have a man who is so compromised that he does, and he doesn't follow the order of God. And he says, I only wish that I had the same bravery that that man did. And so I want to be buried at, next to him. At least I'll have that association. And that's the way it is with many of our compromising ministers across Christendom today. They know better. They just don't have the guts to teach the Word of God. And later on they will spout out these very beautiful little phrases and they want the best to, uh, to take place and the Lord bless you and, and all of these things. And it's meaningless because they have turned their back on the God that they're supposed to serve. So ordination is not a light casual thing it's a very significant thing and a man who is ordained into the gospel ministry better better take it into good consideration because it is a serious thing this passage of scripture um, leaves us with a really bad taste in our mouth but Life is life, and each person has to decide whether or not he's going to be true to his calling or not. Now, the career of a man of God begins with his salvation. It begins with his plighting to uh, his loyalty to the Lord. And then that loyalty is tested on each and every mission that he sent. But even a man of God can be deceived. And this man shouldn't have been deceived because he could have said, hey, you're no Pope. And if God wanted to say something to me, he would have. He already has. Today we have the Word of God. It's been said. There's nothing new to be added to it. One of the worst violators of this are those preachers that speak in tongues. These people who have prophetic dreams. And what do they do? They add to the Word of God. They say, well, an angel came to me and talked to me. Come to my house and eat some bread and drink some water. And they may be flamboyant. They may be exciting. But they're false. Well, with that, we're going to have to close for uh, this morning. Let's stand and we can be dismissed with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how thankful we are that we have your word and that your word was authored by a God who does not change, does not alter. There's no shadow of turning in you. We thank you, Father, that we can base our salvation on your word. We can base our growth on your word. We can base our entire loyalty on your word. 
And so, Father, we pray that the Lord Jesus Christ might be honored through the life of each one of us here. That is our quest. That is our dream. And we ask it in His name. Amen. We are dismissed. Thank you.